Jane Austen was able to visit the late 20th century for just one day, she would undoubtedly be extremely surprised and highly delighted at the progress of her six novels. For her to walk into any high street bookseller, cinema or video shop, the sight of so many versions of Sense and Sensibility, Pride and Prejudice, Northanger Abbey, Mansfield Park, Emma and Persuasion would put her into the highest of spirits. She would also be greatly diverted by the copious quantity of reviews and literary criticisms written about her novels. Never in the history of English literature have so many words been penned about so few. However, her sense of humour would not fail her, and perhaps she would repeat these lines which portrayed her as such a modest author in her day. I think I may boast myself to be, with all possible vanity, the most unlearned and uninformed female who ever dared to be an authoress. If we consider a selection of comments made about Jane Austen's work, there is great variation. From Sir Walter Scott's admiration of her most distinguished characters, well-bred country gentlemen and ladies sketched with originality and precision, written in Jane's own lifetime, to D.H. Lawrence's abhorrence of a narrow-gutted spinster who he felt to be thoroughly unpleasant, English in the bad, snobbish sense of the word. It is not the passage of time that marks the difference, though. Kipling wrote poems in praise of Jane Austen that were responsible for inspiring a Janeite following, but Charlotte Bronte, closer to Jane Austen in time, found her disappointing. Charlotte may have accused Jane of being out of touch with the passions, but it is obvious that Jane inflamed the passions in her readers, with the people who dislike her work doing so with as much venom as those who revere her work with such love. In a time when the novel was frowned upon in some areas of cultured society, the Reverend George Austin, Jane's father, kept a good library. The family would spend evenings reading aloud. They were great novel readers and not ashamed of being so, going as far as to subscribe to a private lending library. Newspapers and letters were also read aloud, with the Austins delighting in anything humorous. As a consequence, when letters were written, it was with a view to having them read out loud. Therefore, it would have been a natural progression for Jane Austen in her early teenage years, returned from school, to take up writing. She was bright and witty, and used her developing literary skills to amuse her family. A good example of this is The History of England, that she wrote when she was only 16 years old. Her sense of humour was already playful, as we can see from the title she gave it. A History of England by a partial, prejudiced and ignorant historian. This history of England is part of the three volumes usually referred to as Jane Austen's Juvenilia. Jane herself called them Volume the First, Second and Third. The best known is probably the second volume, Love and Friendship, from which the history of England comes. These notebooks are full of tales and family jokes, and although these have all been published, Jane Austen obviously felt her youthful years could have been better spent. Her niece, Caroline, remembers her Aunt Jane's warning. If I would take her advice, I should cease writing till I was 16. She had herself often wished she had read more and written less in the corresponding years of her own life. Despite this comment, Jane Austen was well read and, as we've already mentioned, was an unashamed admirer of the English novel. In Jane Austen's day, the novel still had a dubious reputation because of its initial tendency in the 17th century to be associated with romance and illicit love. The novel, which did much to change people's attitude and perhaps has the best claim to be the first English novel, is Daniel Defoe's Robinson Crusoe, published in 1719. The strongest feature is its powerful narrative, and although a desert island is a romantic enough notion, the psychological explorations of Crusoe staying sane are a million miles away from the love trysts of the genre's early examples. The next landmark for Jane would have been Samuel Richardson's Pamela, 
published in 1740. This one, if not about romance exactly, certainly held true to the original novel subject matter of illicit love. Written in letter form, it looks at the seduction of the heroine, Pamela, and her attempts to maintain her virtue. There were complaints of impropriety, and Richardson did modify his work. Richardson had significant influence on Jane Austen's work, as did Samuel Johnson. Johnson is perhaps best known for producing the first English dictionary, but it was the quality of his fine moral writing which impressed Jane so much. She also loved the humour of the very earthy Tom Jones by Henry Fielding, which was published in 1749. There was, however, a more serious side to Fielding. He was a magistrate who fought hard against corruption, and there are difficult issues tackled in his work. Less serious a little later, and a great influence on the work of Jane Austen, were the novels of Fanny Burney. Evelina was published in 1778, Cecilia in 1782, and Camilla in 1778, and Jane does make reference to them. The theme of the novels is the entrance of a young girl into society, and this is certainly in the background of Eleanor and Marianne, Jane Austen's attempt at a novel in letter form, after the style of Samuel Richardson, one of her favourite authors. Even at this early stage, Jane Austen's attention to characterisation is sharp and colourful, leading us to suspect that Jane was an avid people-watcher who could also eavesdrop to great effect. Eleanor and Marianne has a light-hearted feel to it, written when Jane was just 20. However, this becomes considerably more serious by the time it is reworked as Sense and Sensibility. This may have had something to do with the life experience Jane acquired between 1795, when she wrote Eleanor and Marianne, and 1797, when she started to write Sense and Sensibility. She discovered the evil designs young men could have on young women, and also the avaricious designs young women could have on young men. The disastrous nature of seduction for young women described in Richardson's Pamela was no doubt proved accurate by gossip whispered in Jane's own circle of acquaintance. Tales of poor unfortunate creatures who had been robbed of their virtue were to be pitied and whose speedy death, preferably by consumption, was to be wished for as the only dignified outcome of such troubles. Jane Austen uses such revelations to great advantage in the plot of Sense and Sensibility, which was her first published novel in 1811. It tells the story of two young women, Eleanor and Marianne Dashwood. Society expected a great deal of its young ladies, teaching them every accomplishment imaginable in order to attract a husband. It was considered the duty of every young woman to accept any eligible man who offered. Things were beginning to change though, and for women of Jane Austen's generation, the idea of marrying for love was no longer unthinkable. This was due in part to the growth of Romanticism, a movement which encouraged passionate reactions to every life experience, waging war against the fashion of personal insincerity. The Dashwood sisters mirror this conflict, with Eleanor being the perfect exponent of classicism, with its emphasis on compliant, controlled behaviour, discipline and moderation, which was exactly what polite society expected. Marianne, by contrast, allows her soul to be in turmoil, passionately looking for love and fulfilment. Nothing matters beyond what she feels, with no thought spared for what polite society may think. Sense and Sensibility quickly becomes a study into the struggle to find a balance between the two sisters and the two principles. This is not the only theme, and right at the beginning of this novel, Jane Austen introduces a subject that crops up in some shape or form in most of her work. Eleanor, Marianne, their mother and young sister Margaret suffer great indignity and poverty because, as females, they are unable to inherit the estate of their dead father, Mr Henry Dashwood. The estate passes to his son by a previous marriage, Mr John Dashwood, 
The Dashwood ladies are dependent upon John Dashwood's sense of duty, and he lets them down very badly, despite the fact that his father asked him to provide an income for them. As a consequence, Mrs. Dashwood and the girls are thrown out of their own home and financial restraints force them to accept the offer of a cottage in Devon from a wealthy relation. Despite their comparative poverty and their obligation to their wealthy relation, Jane Austen expounds the virtue of a modest life in the country. This was probably due to the fact that at the time of writing this, she was living at the modest rectory at Steventon in Hampshire. Jane's father was the rector, and the family were well aware of the need to carefully manage a budget, especially as there were eight Austin children. This description makes the straitened circumstances of the Dashwood ladies seem at least bearable. It was a pleasant, fertile spot, well wooded and rich in pasture. As a house, Barton Cottage, though small, was comfortable and compact, but as a cottage, it was defective, for the building was regular, the roof was tiled, the window shutters were not painted green, nor were the walls covered in honeysuckles. Before reaching Devon, Eleanor has fallen in love with Edward Ferras, the brother of Mr John Dashwood's wife, Fanny. Fanny makes it very clear that Edward's family expect him to marry well, and the poverty-stricken, though admittedly genteel Eleanor, would not be acceptable. Eleanor sadly resigns herself to this fact and moves away to Devon, understanding that Edward has to consent to the wishes of his family and somehow manages not to take this as a personal slight. Not long after her arrival in Devon, Marianne attracts the attention of the eligible older Colonel Brandon, who she dismisses as far too aged and really rather boring. Then she is literally swept off her feet by a young, tall, handsome stranger. Marianne, while out walking, has fallen and damaged her ankle and is unable to move. The gentleman offered his services, and perceiving that her modesty declined what her situation rendered necessary, took her up in his arms without further delay and carried her down the hill. Marianne throws caution to the wind, and Willoughby, her handsome rescuer, can be in no doubt about her feelings. He takes full advantage of this, with little regard for Marianne's reputation. Her family expects him to propose marriage, as does Marianne herself. Willoughby does not propose, but instead mysteriously disappears to London. Rather than sitting around in the country waiting for his return, Marianne accepts an invitation from a family friend, the eccentric Mrs Jennings, to go to London. She then persuades Eleanor that this is what they should do, even though Eleanor feels that chasing after Willoughby to London may be indiscreet. It is interesting to note the change in Jane Austen's tone when the scenes change to London, almost giving the impression that bad things are bad to happen in town. Marianne is completely preoccupied with seeing Willoughby. She is blatantly oblivious to anything but him. As time ticks by, she fails to make contact with him, despite the fact that she has been writing to Willoughby every day since her arrival in London. The practice of letter writing had very strict taboos in the 1790s. Unless a young lady was engaged to a gentleman, etiquette forbade them to write to each other. Marianne breaks all the rules, takes quite a risk for her day, and Willoughby still ignores her. When they accidentally meet at a ball, he is very uncomfortable and embarrassed as he has become engaged to an heiress, a situation necessitated by his financial needs. 